All right, so I have a new Substack essay out that I've been working on for the past couple of weeks. It's my longest and most ambitious Substack essay so far on uh, Putin, Russia, and Oswald Spengler. I had remembered that in Spengler, reading his comments uh, about Russia, uh, there are not that many of them, but one of the things that he did say, so he makes this distinction between uh, a pre-cultural phase and then the cultural phase, which then has an early cultural period and a late cultural period, and then finally a, a, um, a, a civilization stage, which corresponds to the four seasons insofar as the, um, the uh, cultural phase, the early cultural phase corresponds to spring. So the pre-cultural phase comes before the springtime, note that, and the late cultural phase has a summer phase and an autumn phase uh, that it corresponds to, and then finally the civilization, the decadent, degenerate civilization phase corresponds to winter. So in a certain sense, there's five stages if you count the pre-cultural stage. Um, but it's very important because in that book, in The Decline of the West, he says that uh, Russia's Merovingian age, as it were, begins with Ivan the Three's, Ivan the Great's expulsion of the Tatars from Russia in 1480, and then his subsequent unification and major expansion of territory. Let's take a look at that. I've got a couple of maps here. Um, and the, the comparison, the, the one who inaugurates the Merovingian period uh, is actually Clovis. Um, and so here's a map. Um, these are morphologically homologous. In, in other words, with respect to the West and with respect to Russia, uh, this is where each of them is at on their individual timelines. Both enter the pre-cultural period with their sort of Merovingian stages. Uh, kind of easy to remember for Clovis because it, it's 480, whereas for Ivan III, it's 1480. So this is what the kingdom looked like with the Franks and all these various disparate Frankish tribes. Clovis is the first to unify them. Starting in 480, he takes over the, uh, the territory of Soissons and uh, fights the, uh, the Romans, kicks them out, uh, takes over the territory of the Alemanni, uh, unifies all the Franks, the Ripuarian Franks. He, he himself is a Salian Frank. Goes as far north as abutting the Saxons and the Frisians, whom he doesn't bother with. Uh, and then down here, he pushes the Visigoths, who you can see have, are basically owning Spain, and they're in southern Gaul here, uh, which is to say southern France, and pushes them out of southern France all the way back to the Pyrenees. <laughs> so it's a boundary act uh, that Clovis does here massively expanding and basically uh, ushering or inaugurating the West into its pre-culture phase now, which is a period that lasts in both cases, in both Russia and the West, for about four centuries. So from about um, so 480 down to about uh, 900. And same thing with Russia right around 1500 down to 1900, when in both cases in 1900 and in 900, the pre-cultural phase is moved through and the respective societies move into their springtime period as now they have a true sense of mission, purpose, a religious vision, identity, and new arts of form come into being, such as Romanesque cathedrals, which start appearing in the 10th century, um, and uh, the Cathedral of the Armed Forces, which now has appeared in Russia. It was just completed in 2020. Um, okay, so this is the comparison uh, between Clovis and Ivan. Let's take a look at what Ivan did. So Ivan the Third, Ivan the Great, not Ivan the Terrible. He comes almost a century later in the 1550s. Um, but this is what it looked like before Ivan the Third's conquests. So this is after Kievan Rus, which is simply a period of barbarian war bands and tribes. Uh, it's not a sophisticated, literate, or civilized place at all. From 880 uh, down to 1240, when it's conquered by the Mongols who gobble up Kievan Rus. And then Moscow comes into being in the 12th century, and everything shifts to what's called Muscovy here. Here's the name. Muscovy centered in and around Moscow, which is over here. And they've been fighting Tver over here, which is the, the, the primary uh, rival uh, that they've been fighting. And so what Ivan does is he pushes the Tatars, the Mo i.e. the Mongols, out once and for all. Their grip has been loosening anyway, but this is a boundary act, what, what I call a boundary act. And he pushes them out to the east. You can see here the Kazan Khanate, which Ivan the Terrible will later uh, conquer, and uh, shoves them out at the Battle of the Ugra River, uh, as they say in 14, 1480 in his case. And then he proceeds 
uh, on a massive geographical conquest that triples the size of Muscovy. Up here you can see the Republic of Novgorod, which is a very large area to bear over here. And Lithuania, meanwhile, uh, has to, Poland, Lithuania, has taken over the territory that was that used to belong to Kievan Rus. Uh, Rus. Um, Ivan wants it back. And so what he does then here is the map showing his conquests. Then here's the initial core, very homologous, which is a term Spangler uses to show similarity of form as opposed to similarity of function in biology. So uh, this is the core, which corresponds to uh, the original kingdom that we saw here, the tiny little area of Clovis, which he then massively expanded. Here he has taken over the Republic of Novgorod, a very large area geographically. He's finally taken over Tver, shoved out the Tatars, and has taken a huge chunk away from Lithuania, the original zone of Kievan Rus, which down here you can see he's taken Chernogov, um, and uh, just Kiev lies just slightly outside of the zone. But this is... He, he is the first to use the word czar to describe himself, and this is the beginnings of the Russian Empire, um, which won't become an actual empire until Peter the Great. And then so, I'll pretty much leave it here. And Spagler says, um, then if we move down the timeline, what is it, uh, three centuries or so, um, to, let's see, about 1500, 1600, 1700, so about, about two centuries, and we move down to Peter the Great. And so Peter the Great is homologous, that is to say, corresponds to Charlemagne. Uh, they both uh, bring in pseudomorphoses. Peter the Great pseudomorphizes Europe by, or Russia by Europeanizing it and creating uh, what Dostoevsky regarded as, as, as a fake city, St. Petersburg. And then Charlemagne imports a dual pseudomorphosis, Magian, Byzantine, that's Spanglish word for the Judeo-Christian Islamic Byzantine civilization, um, with the uh, the palace of Aachen, which is designed on the model of a Byzantine church, but also it has uh, Spanish Umayyad Arabic influences on the inside, such as the candy striping and the architecture, uh, and of course the classical Greco-Roman pseudomorphosis in that he's trying to revive the ghost of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, he brings in all these scholars, raises the standards of learning, uh, tries to learn how to read himself and sign his name in a very frustrating way, but uh, it's, it's a major event. It's been called the Carolingian Renaissance, and it begins to uh, give the West its identity, and it finishes out the West's pre-cultural period, which then ends right around 900. So my question in all of this was, if Spengler is right about these um, contemporary timelines, and I believe that he is, I, I think nobody had a better eye for culture forms than Spengler, then what does Vladimir Putin, what, what is he homologous to? If we go down the timeline... Uh, who's he homologous to? The, around the year 2000, and then go down a few centuries to the Western timeline. What figure uh, does he correspond to? And if you want to find out who I think that is, and I'm pretty certain I've nailed it, uh, you have to subscribe. $5 a month or $80 a year. Um, and uh, I also do private astrology readings for those interested. Hit me up at johndavidebert at gmail.com. I also do private uh, tutoring. For those who want to want me to walk them through chapter by chapter a work of difficult philosophy, I charge for that, of course. Um, okay, so uh, I'll leave it there and see you on Substack.